All right, so this is a suggestion via donation. The name of the video is uh, Mind-Blowing Conspiracy Theories That Turned Out to Be True. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, if Simon Whistler says it's true, bro, it's true. We all love a good conspiracy theory. For most of us, they're a form of absurdist entertainment. We read Absolutely. stories about how we supposedly never landed on the moon and how the Earth is supposedly flat, and then we have a good laugh Wait. at the people who are dumb enough to believe these things. The Earth isn't flat? But what if we were to tell you that not every conspiracy theory is total nonsense and that for every the Queen was actually a lizard person, there is another that has some truth to it. You'd okay. probably be quite shocked. I mean, how could we make such an outlandish claim? Well, folks, strap in and don your tinfoil hats because here are five conspiracy theories that actually turned out to be true for the most part. Okay. As well. In June 1947, an enigmatic object crashed in the desert on the outskirts of Roswell, New Mexico, propelling the sleep beat down into the annals of extraterrestrial law. The Air Force was quick to quell burgeoning rumors, asserting that the object was no flying saucer, but rather just a mundane weather balloon. But this did little to quell them, and soon enough, the belief that it was actually an alien UFO which crashed at Roswell began to spread all around the US. By the late 90s, these rumors had deep planted roots and had grown into a full on conspiracy theory. UFO enthusiasts the world over became steadfast in their belief that the US government was concealing the true nature of what happened at Roswell. Now, if we were to tell you folks that, sure enough, a UFO did indeed crash at Roswell on that fateful day, I mean, you probably wouldn't believe us. But what if I told you that a UFO did crash at Roswell that very day? Now, before you get too excited and start breaking out first contact protocols, you'll notice that we didn't say an alien UFO there. So allow me okay. to explain. The crashed object was later revealed to be a balloon from Project Mogul, a part of the right. US is clandestine arsenal during the Cold War. As the nation sought every advantage in its delicate power balance with the USSR, the balloons, equipped with top-secret detection technology, were launched into the atmosphere to listen for potential nuclear tests conducted by the Soviets. Since well, it was one of those balloons that crashed in Roswell. So technically, while it might not be what the term UFO brings to mind, as being far more indicative of a spaceship piloted by little grey men with an unhealthy penchant for probing your bottom, technically, an unidentified flying object did indeed crash at Roswell, making this conspiracy theory sort of correct. But yeah, but we can identify it as some type of weather balloon or spy balloon. Uh, so it instantly becomes an identified flying object it's, it's we know what it is already bro all right so technically 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 it's not a ufo but well this raises a question the u.s military isn't exactly known for giving away its secrets right. any brave veterans of the storming of area 51 can attest to that so how exactly do we know about all of this and the answer to that can be found in the early 1990s when a renewed sense of intrigue surrounding the roswell crash was gripping the u.s and many groups were pressuring the u.s government for comment at this time a new mexico senate representative pressed the general accounting office to persuade the pentagon into declassifying documents relating to the roswell incident a request to which the u.s air force finally Finally acquiesced in 1994, releasing the findings of its own internal investigation into the crash. According to this, the debris found near Roswell was most likely from one of the mogul balloons that had not been previously recovered. Given the time and location, the report surmised that this missing balloon, subject to the harsh surface winds, was the much speculated object that landed on a ranch in 1947 and gave birth to the Roswell conspiracy. The report's conclusion was further bolstered by a journal maintained by one of the members of Project Mogul, in which was also released to the public in the 1990s, in which a note from June 1947 referred to a balloon that had never been recovered post-mission. Interestingly, the report also tackled the alien question. Rather, disappointingly, it stated that the Air Force had absolutely no record of any such finds in Roswell. Unless, of course, that's just what they want you to believe, and the report was a fake designed to keep us sheeple in the dark. It wasn't. Yeah. You know, if you're like oh. me and you've been thinking about upgrading your wallet game, then listen up, because Ridge All right, guys, has listen, something... Listen, really quickly, really quickly. I love Simon Whistler. Right. I love his channels, all of them. They're all super amazing. Ridge Wallet, it's a very thin wallet. It can fit in your, your back pocket. It can fit all your cards, all right? But it's also very, very expensive. Um, and I mean very expensive. So I'm telling you the product, but let's move on, okay? Let's just move on. Shadow governments if that's, if that's are your thing, a bit please go to his channel. 
obviously click the link in the description, I'm sure, um, and uh, go get your, your Ridge wallet. Of a recurring theme in conspiracy theories, for some, the notion that a secretive malevolent hierarchy is behind all the world's problems is a bit of a tantalizing concept, providing an emotional scapegoat for the hopeless and frankly quite often dull realities of the world's problems. But don't throw away your tinfoil hat just yet, because what if we were to tell you that deep in the Californian countryside nestled among the mighty redwoods sits a 2,700-acre campground where the world's elites gather yearly to discuss secret things and take part in pagan rituals? Really? Well, sure enough, this exists. Ladies, gentlemen, let me introduce you to the Bohemian Grove Club. The existence of this club is no secret. Indeed, it has been discussed from time to time for decades now. But okay. what is more elusive is the reality of it, as quite understandably, such a club frequented by such people performing such rituals has been subject to plenty of wild speculation over the years. So let's go over what we do know about it for sure. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and guess really quickly. They're full of absolute rich people doing weird things from California, all right? All of the Hollywood elites hang out here, 100%, right? So all the all the weirdness that they do most likely comes from the weirdness that they do, okay? All right. Bohemian Grove is indeed an exclusive fraternity, counting among its members some of the most powerful men in the Western world. It was founded in 1872 by a group of journalists, artists, and musicians who sought uh -huh. a haven from the hustle and bustle of city life. Over time, as the club's members began to invite guests, the membership demographic shifted. The artists and journalists found themselves rubbing elbows with business magnates, military commanders, and politicians, including several U.S. presidents, with notable members including George Bush Sr. and Ronald Reagan. Yet. Despite the change in its membership, the club retained its bohemian ethos of reveling in music, theatre, and nature. Much of the club's controversy stems from its highly secretive nature. Members and their guests must adhere to a so-called weaving spiders come not here motto, i.e. what happens at the Grove stays at the Grove. Journalists are also notably banned from the premises, ensuring that the activities at the club remain largely hidden from public scrutiny. So, knowing this, you're probably wondering how we know anything about the club at all. And that is the product of infiltrations, investigative journalism, and hidden footage. One such infiltrator oh. was Alex Jones, and yep, that Alex Jones, who managed to sneak in with a hidden camera in the year 2000. His footage revealed an enigmatic ceremony, the cremation of the care, where members don costumes and immolate a coffin effigy named Care before a massive owl statue, a spectacle ostensibly linked to a reverence for the surrounding redwoods. The club spokesperson admitted the footage as authenticity but downplayed its significance as a traditional musical drama celebrating nature in summertime. Further insight came from spy magazine writer Philip Weiss, who in 1989 infiltrated the encampment, posing as a guest for seven days. His expose inside Bohemian Grove is our main and really only source for a detailed understanding of what actually happens there each year, documenting the peculiar and supposedly liberating ritual of public urination practiced by the rich and powerful attendees. He also documented plays where men portray women, comedy shows, and late side talks featuring high-ranking officials sharing otherwise undisclosed information. Knowing all of this is hard to restrain the imagination, really. I mean, it's a forest full of the Western world's elites partaking uh -huh. in all sorts of pretty bizarre rituals. I mean, we wouldn't blame you for speculating and starting to connect the dots in your minds, but... Ah, uh, yeah we should stress, as damning as it may look on the surface, evidence of any great machinations occurring at the club have yet to surface, and current evidence simply points to it being an extravagant camping holiday in which the world's rich and powerful men relive their university days. But still, a secret society of the rich and powerful does indeed exist, so for our purposes, conspiracy proven. Oh, God, that's not gonna work well. All right, listen, so I've never heard of this in my life. I also don't, I never really like, you know, I don't frequent myself in the conspiracy theorists like, you know, circles. So of course I would never hear of some random secret, an actually real uh, secret society where um, the world's elites uh, hang out together and they, they speak on classified information openly and they, they play dress up and they dance uh, uh, and do all types of weirdness while urinating, you know, you know, freely, right? This is such a weird thing to encounter. I'm going to have to now thoroughly in invest myself into that subject. 
Through the annals of American history, few events have proved as unsettling and consequential as Edward Snowden's revelations of mass surveillance by the United States' National Security Agency, or NSA. For years, the public engaged in heated debates, entertaining rumors and suspicions concerning the extent of the NSA's watchful gaze. These whispers were invariably dismissed as the paranoid ramblings of conspiracy theorists, their claims seen as too Orwellian to possibly be true. Oh, However, true. in 2013, these allegations crossed the boundary between fantasy and fact, plunging the global community into an intense reckoning with the ethics of surveillance, privacy, and security. This boundary was crossed by Edward Snowden, a former NSA contractor who leaked a treasure trove of classified documents to the public. These documents exposed a chilling truth. The NSA had been conducting widespread, warrantless surveillance of American citizens, phones, and internet activities. The echo of Big Brother from George Orwell's 1984 resonated in this revelation, leaving the world shocked and appalled at the reach of the clandestine operation. Project PRISM was among the most contentious programs uncovered by Snowden's leaks. It allowed the NSA unfettered access to the servers of nine major tech companies, including Google, Apple, and Facebook. The agency could pry into individual search histories, email content, file transfers, and live chats, a level of access access that amounted to a digital strip yeah, search. This right. intrusion wasn't confined within the borders of the United States. It stretched it out to foreign nationals and governments, trampling upon right. the diplomatic norms of respecting other nations' sovereignty. Another egregious program code named X Keyscore operated like a Google for private communications. The NSA could probe into individuals' browsing histories, emails, and other digital activities simply by entering their name or email address into the system. No warrant required. It was as if every internet user had unknowingly volunteered for an Orwellian nightmare, their every digital footstep scrutinized under the unblinking eye of the NSA. What followed Snowden's disclosures was an unprecedented upheaval. Civil liberties organizations, privacy advocates, and common citizens worldwide expressed their outrage, demanding accountability right. and reforms. The United States, typically seen as a beacon of freedom and individual rights, was thrust under an uncomfortable spotlight. Its reputation for upholding democratic values very much in question. Right. Despite Listen, we say a lot of things, like, as Americans and, like, the U.S. government, like, guys, we say a lot of things, but it doesn't mean that all of these things are actually factual, right? Uh, they, you know, they, they're kind of set up to comfort you, I'd say, right? But the opposite is, in fact, being done consistently. Like, the fact that most people think that there's a difference, a serious difference between the left and the right in America, <laughs> bro, that is insane. All right, the people, as in the regular people that 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 subscribe to the politics, right? They generally go super hard for their side, but then don't you see them in like the chambers, bro? They're they're best friends, but yet you can't be best friends with your your nephew that has a different political view as you. Come on, bro. That's you know. Listen, you're being played, guys openly, openly being played. Spotlight, its reputation for upholding democratic values very much in question. Despite the global outcry, the US government's response was ambivalent. While some acknowledged the need for a more balanced approach between national security and privacy, others defended the surveillance as essential for thwarting potential terrorist activities. Snowden, having exposed the world's most potent intelligence apparatus, was charged under the Espionage Act and he sought asylum in Russia. The aftershocks of Snowden's actions continue to reverberate, forcing nations to grapple with the moral and ethical implications of mass surveillance. And for us, discounting the notion that mass government surveillance is right. a conspiracy theory once and for all. You got to pay attention when the government starts uh, trying to play down things that are somewhat serious to the people. Like, be fully aware whenever they start doing that. That's where you should probably be paying more attention. Conspiracy theories often come bedecked with a sense of intrigue, a dash of incredulity, and an insatiable curiosity for the truth. One such theory revolves around the Gulf of Tonkin incident that catalyzed the Vietnam War. It simmered for decades in the public's consciousness. Skeptics argued it was a false flag operation, a bold and brazen assertion that was, for years, casually brushed off. In the end, however, the conspiracy theorists were vindicated, their paranoia 
proving prophetic. It all goes back to 1964, when the American vessels USS Maddox and USS Turner Joy reported an unprovoked assault in the Gulf of Tonkin by North Vietnamese naval forces. The incident rapidly escalated into an international crisis and resulted in the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. This seemingly open-ended mandate endorsed by Congress gave President Lyndon B. Johnson the authority to deploy military forces in Southeast Asia as he saw fit, marking the official commencement of a full-scale U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. Yet the shadow of doubt hung heavily over this narrative. Claims of an unprovoked attack seemed dubious to skeptics, who conjectured that the incident was manufactured to justify an unpopular war. This theory was relegated to the fringes of political discourse for decades, with naysayers dismissed as fanciful conspiracy theorists. It all came out in 2005 when the NSA declassified an internal study. It revealed that the second reported attack in the Gulf of Tonkin had in fact never been confirmed. Misinterpreted radar and sonar data, it seemed, had painted an inaccurate picture, and keen to never let a good track tragedy go to waste, the US government had used this as an excuse to escalate their role in the conflict. The revelations from the NSA declassification were not just a bombshell for the public, but also for historians and political analysts mm -hmm. who had, until then, accepted the official narrative. Digging into the release data, several corroborating reports and testimonies were also later brought to light. For example, it emerged that Lieutenant Commander James Stockdale, a pilot flying cover from the USS Ticonderoga on the night of the second incident, had stated in his 1984 book that he saw no enemy craft. To quote him, I had the best seat in the house to watch that event, and our destroyers were just shooting at phantom targets. There were no PT boats there. There was nothing there but black water and American firepower. Further, former Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara in the 2003 documentary The Fog of War admitted that the attack had not happened. Thus, the credibility of the Gulf of Tonkin incident was permanently undermined, vindicating the conspiracy theory that it was indeed a false flag operation. This deceit had profound ramifications. It meant that over 58,000 American soldiers had lost their lives in a war justified by a lie. It meant that the Vietnamese people, who suffered casualties well into the millions, had to suffer through the war being dragged out for years long thanks to the subsequent enormous injection of American men, money, and materials. And again, it was all over a lie. Bro. Bro. Ugh. The 17th... Like, all this does is give credence, right, to um, some absolutely insane people and their theories, all right? It does. Because, look, I can say anything now. <laughs> Right? And either you believe it or not, but remember this story that, that everyone was saying wasn't true and you find out that it's true? What about that? Hmm? So imagine you're now allowing a lot of crazies to say a lot of crazy things and believe that they're actually factual, bro. But, but what's right is in fact right. All right. What's crazy is still crazy, bro. The 17th of July 2015 was a truly special day in internet history, for it was the day that the rather controversial internet personality Alex Jones proclaimed loud and proud that I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay! Oh, how we all laughed at... What? Where was I? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> frogs? Okay. All right. The, w the chemicals in the water that turn frogs... Oh, yeah. The barefaced absurdity of the claim being laid before us. But what if we were to tell you, ladies and gents, that just for once, like the proverbial broken clock that is right twice a day, Alex Jones was actually onto something here. What happened? Sort of. Allow me to explain. Uh, please. You see, the tale of sexuality-altering hormones making their way into our water supply, though simplified and twisted in Jones's narrative, does have roots in reality. Consider the plight of our amphibian friends, the frogs. In the wrong environment, they can undergo dramatic- Bro, you're about to get canceled. You're, you're about to get canceled. Wherever, wherever we're going with this, it just sounds like you're about to get canceled. All right, you cannot say this. Okay. No outside influence is the resp- or, mm, See, I'm not look, look what I'm- Okay, hold on. <laughs> Bro, no outside influence caused that causes this. All right. 
dramatic physiological changes, even shifts in their gender. This, in and of itself, is a completely natural phenomenon and not exclusively caused by exposure to particular chemicals in the water. But saying that, it does indeed appear as though certain chemicals, which sure enough do find their way into the water supply by human hands, can induce this state in particular breeds of frogs. But, much to Alex's disappointment, they don't find their way into the water by means of some harebrained globalist conspiracy, but rather something much more mundane, just it being the pills that we take daily. In his book Troubled Water, activist Seth Siegel elucidates the long journey that the chemicals in birth control pills take after consumption. As our bodies only absorb a fraction of the pill's ingredients, the bulk, around 90%, is excreted either via urine or sweat. The expelled content, imbued with a synthetic estrogen called EE2, then wends its way to our wastewater plants. E2 is an endocrine disruptor, has the potential to interfere with the reproductive hormones and development, particularly when consumed in excess or by sensitive populations such as infants. He goes on to further explain that, in total, more than 10 million doses of synthetic estrogen permeate America's wastewater every day, a result of 15 million people regularly taking these pills. The plot thickens further when he explains that, despite the common assumption that dilution can solve this problem, even filtered waters reveal traces of many pharmaceutical compounds. Going on further to explain that, astonishingly, residue of other drugs like Prozac have been detected in fish residing in the Great Lakes. Moreover, the estrogen in rivers and lakes in the northeast US has caused male fish to develop female biomarkers, including ovaries. In extreme cases, exposure to E2 has even led to decreased fertility in fish across generations. Given these known effects on a less complex organism, a question naturally might arise that's could humans also be affected? Now this I knew I knew this is where we were gonna land, and bro. <laughs> you trying to get me canceled. You trying to get canceled and me in proximity. All right, I've already been canceled. Okay. YouTube was like enough. <laughs> like a couple of months ago, bro. November it was. All right. Listen, we don't need to go down this road again. So please just be kind. Okay. Be kind. This question might have you racing to InfoWars to pick up one of Alex's conveniently marketed water filters, but if this is you, worry not, because we need to make it abundantly clear that scientific understanding of the potential implications for human health remains incomplete, and while we absolutely cannot say that it's all cushy, neither can we say that there is need to panic. We simply don't know for certain with the present research. In response to the scientific gap, Siegel advocates for a proactive stance, one in which he says it is probably a prudent idea to put in some effort to remove these compounds at water treatment plants, but neither should we panic or even begin to consider something radical like banning these medications upon which billions of people rightly depend every day. And this brings us neatly back on estrogen? to Alex Jones, with whom we initially credited with very sloppily bringing this situation to the public's attention. His claim was, if you recall, that I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay! We also stated well, that, that is a crazy statement. this was kind of true. And indeed, it does appear that if you squint at the claim really really hard, it does somewhat morph into an accurate depiction of reality, but we should also stress the parts that he got wrong. Firstly, it isn't just frogs, it's a whole range of aquatic animals. Secondly, they aren't turning them gay so much as they are changing their genders. And finally, it happens significantly less than Alex's somewhat Wait, what, what, what just... whole range of aquatic animals. Secondly, they aren't turning them gay so much as they are changing their genders. And finally, it happens significantly less than Alex's okay. somewhat dramatic delivery would suggest. But you know what? For a claim that outlandish and memed upon, we can't even be mad. We're just low-key impressed that there was any truth to it at all. All right, bro. Okay. Guys, yeah, I didn't know about it. 90% of these things. Uh, again, I don't, I'm not in the circles of, of conspiracy theory type talk. Whenever I hear it, I'm just like, eh, that sounds a little crazy, bro. Uh, you know, if it's true, I'll believe that it's true, but I'm going to call you crazy until I find that it's true. I'm sorry. All right, that's who I am internally, deeply. I cannot accept what someone says, basically ever, unless there's like literal proof in, that you can show me, bro. I don't believe things that people say. Like, almost never. Um, but all right, listen, <laughs> uh, you guys have an absolutely amazing day. Enjoy your day thoroughly. Guys, before we go, are you guys subscribed to the other channels? Logical Movie Reviews with Mr. L. Boyd along with Mr. L. Boyd Music. Both are found in the description. Check it out.